right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and we do have a whole bunch of groups joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today's special for a number of reasons. Number one, all November long through early December, we have been doing amazing conservation stories. So if you've chatted with us or caught up with us, we've done lemurs and tigers already today. We've got a whole bunch more to wrap up the year, and it's just been a really exciting time highlighting amazing people and stories from across the globe. Today also marks our last final week of 2020 in terms of sessions. We only have seven more days. The 17th is our last program. So thank you guys for joining us on the home stretch. It's been a really, really exciting year. I think 550 programs we run since January 1st. So it's been a crazy time. We're all going to go rest and open some presents together soon. Um, and we really appreciate you joining us live or on YouTube over this really incredible and odd 2020 year. So, in today's talk, we're going to cover something that we've never covered before, a new topic with a new speaker, which is always exciting for me. We are joined all the way in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories in Canada by Dwayne Wolgamuth. So, he conducted Canadian Geographic's Expedition of the Year in hiking over 800 kilometers in the Northwest Territories, probably Canada's most remote and amazing region uh, that we have. So, for a lot of our students joining us today in Ontario and across the southern parts of Canada, this will be an entirely new and wild, amazing habitat that you guys will have the chance to discover with me today. I'm really excited to introduce it to you. And so without further ado, Dwayne, thank you so much for joining us and take us away. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is fantastic and such a treat to uh, be in front of so many people. I've never done an online presentation before, so this is a little bit uh, uh, interesting and new for me as well. So um, yes, as Jesse said, I spent uh, 41 days um, hiking this esker um, in the Northwest Territories. And uh, I know a lot of you are fairly young classrooms, um, so you might not have heard the word tundra. So tundra is basically everything above tree line. So it's an area where climate is not friendly enough for trees. So it's a short summer and it's cold. And so we have small shrubs but uh, but no big trees. So this photo here on the front shows you a pretty good idea of what it was like. Um, only a few short shrubs and uh, yeah. And so the views are amazing. You can see very far and uh, it's very remote. So where I flew, I had to fly into the beginning of my hike and I had to fly out. And so the beginning where I started was 600 kilometers by air from Yellowknife. So it was a long, expensive flight. And that's part of the reason why I um, looked for funding to help to pay for this expedition. So, okay. So the um, questions that I'm going to try to answer for you guys today, um, why did I hike the Thelon Esker? And then explain what an Esker is and how they're formed and then give you a map of the Thelon Esker to show where it is and why Eskers are important. And then uh, a few uh, um, treasured photos from some wildlife I saw and some stories. And then, uh, and then of course, what are the biggest challenges of hiking the Thelon Esker? And then I'm looking forward to questions from you guys. So, so <clears throat> the very, excuse me, the very first photo you saw before the presentation, um, kind of before I came online, uh, was a hike we, my, me and my partner did on the Arctic coast. And so I hiked a couple kilometers on this little tiny esker on the Arctic coast once. And that's what got me super keen and thinking, oh, I need to hike an esker again. And so I learned about this esker only a year ago now. And I I had been in Yellowknife for 14 years and I thought, wow, I never knew about this esker before. And a lot of people even in the Northwest Territories don't know about this esker. And it's really only researchers that have been um, dealing with this esker and know about it. It's really not known in the public sphere outside of research. So as soon as I learned about it, I thought, oh man, we need to put this thing on the map. And the best way to you know, increase awareness about this esker is maybe to hike it. So. Um, and it's entirely in the Northwest Territories where I live. And as I started learning more about how eskers are formed, I, I was just, I was captivated and amazed at how these features are uh, formed. And you'll see some more photos of eskers. So what are eskers? Um, there was an ice age across North America um, about, uh, 
um, I guess a lot of the melt happened kind of around 10,000 years ago. And so the eskers are formed from rivers that flowed on or under the glacier. So they're sediment, basically sand and gravel and cobbles that uh, was carried by rivers that flowed under the under these glaciers. And so this is a uh, this is maybe a bit of a complicated diagram, but it shows a little bit as the glacier recedes, this melt water that flows down through a crack in the glacier um, then becomes a river flowing under the glacier and then deposits these little formations as it recedes. So you get a ridge, but then you also have what's called esker fans. And so those are often sandy areas and they can spread out sideways and beyond the, the main ridge. So. So this is one of the more beautiful stretches of Esker and very typical uh, Esker Ridge. It's mostly sand and it's like, once you're on the top of this, it's almost like walking on a sidewalk. I would say even better because it's not quite so hard as concrete. <laughs> and then from the air, this is uh, a photo I took from my flight out to the beginning of my hike. And uh, you can see the Esker kind of snakes across the landscape. It's a bit of a ridge and it winds and twists a little bit like a, a modern river would. And then uh, another photo of an esker in the fall when the colors change. So towards the end of my hike, then uh, a lot of the Arctic plants, um, the red one in this photo is Arctic bearberry. They turn color and uh, just becomes, yeah, amazing colors. And so if you can see the little line, um, this is a, an image from Google Earth. And there's a line that starts on the right-hand side and uh, goes up towards Great Bear Lake. So that's the esker. This is in Northern Canada. The esker's all within the Northwest Territories. I uh, started right on the Eastern end, um, basically at the border with Nunavut and then hiked Northwest um, for about 800 kilometers. And so eskers, uh, are very important ecologically. They provide, um, a lot of the tundra has permafrost, which means the ground is frozen. And it's really hard for animals to make dens in that kind of ground. But on the esker, you get a lot of sand and dry material and it's high and they can build amazing dens. So this den in this photo is actually a wolf den that I found. I didn't see the wolves, but uh, there was fresh tracks and some goose feathers outside the outside the den. And so the eskers also provide microclimates for plants. So if you have a, an esker, <clears throat> it will have a sunny south side and you'll get a lot of warm heat loving plants. And then on the north side, you get a lot of cold loving plants. And then the eskers also provide really easy travel for humans and animals and uh, was used a, they were used a lot for hunting and camping by Aboriginal people in the past. And so the, now the wildlife, yeah, no lions and tigers on the, uh, in the Arctic uh, tundra, but uh, the really cool creatures, I think m one of my favorites for sure is the muskox. And uh, I saw a whole herd of muskox. So in sheer numbers, I saw more muskox than any other uh, large animal. And this is a really interesting one. You guys might guess before I say what produced this. Um, I don't very often take images of poo, but this was so amazing. I had to, this is actually bear scat and uh, bear poo. And they're eating so many berries on the eskers at this time of year that uh, they have pretty runny poo and it, uh, it gets splattered across the sand. And this is a dig from a grizzly. So there's a lot of ground squirrels on the eskers as well because they can build dens and live in the eskers so easily. And so they're one of the favorite foods of grizzlies. So grizzlies will just go mad digging for ground squirrels. So um, for me, I didn't really wanna see grizzlies. I'm traveling alone and uh, want to keep my distance <clears throat> from grizzlies. <clears throat> but so every time I saw a dig like that, it made me nervous. And caribou, there's supposed to be a lot of caribou in the tundra in Canada, but the numbers of the herds are not doing so well recently. And so I didn't actually see very many. <clears throat> and uh, 
but I did see a lot of shed antlers or antlers from uh, dead caribou. So this one is an, a, an animal that died and you can see the two antlers are attached and the base of the skull is there. And uh, I actually contacted a photographer, Michael Lookman, and uh, he allowed me to use a few of his photos. So this is a nice close up of what a caribou looks like if for anyone who has not seen a, a photo of a caribou. And moose, I didn't get a good photo. So again, I'm using Michael's, but um, you might not believe that there's moose so far north on the Canadian tundra. But uh, sure enough, there are moose that wander even above tree line. They're mostly an animal that lives in the trees, but um, there's a decent number of moose up on the tundra. And uh, I saw four of them, almost as many moose as I saw caribou. And Arctic wolves, again, the, the number of Arctic wolves in this region of the tundra are not as high now because the caribou are their main source of food and the caribou aren't doing so well right now. But I did see four wolves along the way um, and one was a pup. Um, I actually saw them at their den on the side of the esker. So that was really cool. And so now we'll get into the challenges of hiking the Thelon Esker. There's lots of them, and I have a few photos to try and show you um, for the various challenges. So probably the biggest one is black flies. You've probably heard stories of how bad bugs can get um, in the wilderness, and especially on the tundra, you have a lot of black flies. And so I wore socks over my hands to not get bites on my hands, and I wore a head net over my head. So. I, that was my how I looked for most of the hike. <laughs> and then uh, river and lake crossings. <clears throat> so there's a lot of lakes and a lot of rivers on the tundra. And um, because the ground is so frozen, there's a lot of water on the surface. And so I did 54 boat crossings during my hike. And so this is me sitting on a beach and inflating my little uh, pack boat. Uh, to prepare for a, a lake crossing. And it would take an average of about 50 breaths to fill, like 50 full, full breaths to fill this boat. So it took a little bit of time to uh, inflate it. So, and this is, uh, this is um, a river that I actually crossed on foot, but it might've been safer to go away from the rapid and do it with my boat. But uh, those rocks are slippery and you've got flowing water and, uh, that was a bit of a sketchy or dangerous crossing, but uh, that gives you an idea of some of the rivers I had to cross. And then tundra winds. So on the tundra where there's no trees, then the wind just blows incessantly. It's always blowing. And uh, I shouldn't say always, there are pauses, but um, so then this is me drying my tent on the top of the esker. So often, <clears throat> because of the wind, I could take a, you know, a 20 minute break in the afternoon and uh, just dry my tent in the wind like this. And the lack of shelter. So again, I talk a lot about the lack of trees. So the tundra without trees, for the most part, I tried to camp on the esker or near the esker. And so the ridge, um, the ridge of the esker can provide shelter. So in this area of the tundra, the winds are dominant from the east and the north. So then I would typically try to be on the south or the west side of the esker to make camp so that I could be out of the wind. But the esker isn't perfectly continuous. There are gaps in various locations. And so you know, some of those gaps were really long, like even 20 or 30 kilometer gaps where um, where the esker just didn't form a ridge. And so then I'm, I'm basically camping out in the open. So out of those 41 days, I had to camp out in the open tundra without any kind of shelter for about, for two nights only. So it wasn't too bad, but both nights I was like, you know, crossing my fingers and hoping that I wouldn't get a, a storm. And so this is one of those two nights and you can see by the shape of the tent, there is a good wind blowing on it, but, uh, not a crazy, uh, not a crazy storm, at least. And so there was a lot of up, down, up, down. I was following the ridge of the Esker because I wanted to be on the top and I wanted to enjoy that view. 
and I wanted to be in the breeze as well because that kept the bugs away. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was, I kept my GPS on the entire time for the first two weeks because I had lots of um, power and I wanted to take photos along the way that I could waypoint later so that I could have them located where they are on the earth. And so my GPS told me that I was going up and down an average of 720 meters a day. So in addition to doing 20 kilometers of hiking, I was going up and down every day an average of 720 meters. So that's like, uh, oof, yeah, I don't know which mountain that might compare to, but uh, it's not a huge mountain. It's low, but still having to hike up and down every day. And this is a view from uh, one of the ridges. Okay, yeah, so grizzly bears. Um, I didn't get close enough to get a good photo like this, but uh, um, because I was traveling solo and really focusing on safety and minimizing my risk, then I tried to, as soon as I saw grizzlies, it was all about uh, um, not disturbing them and trying to stay as far away as I could. And so um, I encountered nine grizzlies along the way. Two of them I managed to sneak around but there was uh, seven of them that uh, saw me and uh, it was like, okay, what's gonna happen here? And so, um, yes, it was, uh, there was, there was one bear for sure that uh, made me a bit nervous. And uh, several times I had the safety off on my bear spray, but I never had to use it. So uh, that was good. And another huge challenge for hiking, um, you have to carry everything on your back and so, in order to um, lighten that amount of weight, to not have as much weight, then I packed light on food. I tried not to bring too much food, and but that meant I tried to harvest from the land a bit. And so this was a typical breakfast um, where I had a lot of berries and just a little bit of granola. <laughs> and these are cloud berries. Um, they're a tundra berry. Probably most of you have never seen them before. Um, they only grow on the tundra, but they're really common um, in the Arctic communities. People pick them a lot and really enjoy them. And cooking as well. Um, for hiking, um, often people will carry a fuel stove, for example, but for that many days, I didn't want to carry fuel and I didn't want something that could ever possibly break. So a stove that has parts that could possibly break, I didn't want to risk that. Um, plus I enjoy just uh, wood fires. And so I, I built myself, I've used it on previous hikes as well, but um, a little twig stove. So I used an old steel coffee can and uh, built a twig stove. So this is me cooking uh, mushrooms that I gathered on the hike and cooking them over a little twig stove. So you can actually see the flame uh, poking out of, the, uh, out of the twig stove. And so this is probably one of the more minor challenges, but it was definitely still something that occupied my mind while I was hiking. Um, because I was so remote and uh, out there for so long, I needed to keep my devices charged. So for example, I was communicating with an inReach, which is a message that, or a, a device that sends text messages, but by satellite. And uh, so I used a little solar panel and I learned how to put it on my backpack so that I could uh, charge while I was walking. So with that little solar panel, I was able to keep um, my camera and my in-reach devices charged so I could stay in touch with other people. And so, yeah, that's uh, the first good synopsis of my presentation. And uh, I want to thank my sponsors. They are Mountain Equipment Co-op, Seek Outside, and um, the Royal Canadian Geographic Society. Um, yeah, I, I meant to add their logo and I forgot it, but uh, the, um, I really appreciate the funding. I did get a, a very good um, uh, gear sponsorship from Mountain Equipment Co-op that helped me along the way. So it was, uh, yes. It was, a, it was a fun time. By the end, my body was a little bit exhausted and I was happy to be finished, but uh, only a few weeks after I was back, then I, uh, I wanted to go back out and do more hiking, so. That's I, look, 
Great. That was great. Thank you so, so much. And I mean, not only do we get this chance to see something that we, you know, again, we've never seen here at Exploring Mothers, mm -hmm. but I like how important glaciology and, and sort of the uh, sort of ice mm -hmm. was to shaping Canada's landscape to something that's really exciting. And I've never seen it depicted mm -hmm. like that way. I've never seen that like that. So that was wonderful. Um, yes. We'll also, we'll get the Canadian Geographic logo up forever and after the fact. So you guys can check that out. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to dive in with questions for all our groups joining on YouTube. Let me know where you're coming in from. I'd love to see if we have any profiles up there. You can share your questions in the chat bar. We can do that, right? But what I'm going to start with is a question from Ms. Erickson's class. So they're joining us in Stafford Springs in Connecticut. So Ms. Erickson, do you want to come in? Kick us off with a question. Just do you need your mic and you're good to go. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, sorry, we were just a few minutes late. I don't know if you talked about polar bears. I don't know if you were or have any experience with bears while you're in the tundra. Um, so if you could please let us know. Yeah. Oh, Dwayne, your audio cut out for a second. Oh, let's see if we can get Dwayne back. So you can still hear us, but we can't hear you anymore. Oh, you know, there we go. Is that better? You're good. You're set. <laughs> okay. I was trying to adjust my headset volume, but I accidentally hit the mute button, I think. So. That's okay. Okay. So, yes, I was far enough from the Arctic coast that uh, I didn't have to worry about polar bears. Um, they do come inland from the coast uh, sometimes during the summer before the ice forms but uh, not as far as where I was. So I was far enough inland that the only bears that uh, I would encounter were grizzly bears. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Ms. Erickson. Nice question to kick us off. Let's go to Ms. Gerda's class. I'm joining us at Halton Virtual North. Uh, if you want to do me your mic, okay. go for it. Okay. Hi, thanks, Dwayne. That was fantastic. We learned so much and had a lot of our questions already answered. Uh, we talked about you talked about the food that you ate, but a lot of my class wants to know if you had to go hunting, did you go fishing, the fishing pool, what did you drink? Yes, great question. So when I was planning my hike, I was planning to catch a lot of fish along the way. But in the end, um, a lot of the lakes on or by the Esker were shallower than I expected and a lot warmer too. And so I had a lot of trouble catching fish. And um, over the first week I fished in a fair number of places, but the lakes were really warm and shallow and I didn't have any luck. And then the other problem as well was a lot of the places where streams cross the Esker or flow that, and I had to cross those streams, there's a lot of willows and alder that can actually be up to 10 feet tall. And, uh, and so it's like, um, I'd be walking through those streams and I'm pulling branches apart to get through them. And so I actually wasn't able to keep fishing line on my rod because um, it would get caught in those branches. So anytime I wanted to fish, then I would have to pull the reel and line out of my backpack, put it on the rod, assemble it, put on a leader. And so it became a lot more work. And so, um, Partway through, I realized that I had enough food and I basically began to treat fishing as, uh, as an emergency measure so that if I got injured or for some reason couldn't make progress for a day or two, um, I would definitely spend time fishing. But So then I focused it on distance and uh, making progress and just used fishing as a backup. Um, I had thought about hunting along the way, but uh, chose not to take a rifle uh, just for weight and uh, to minimize the amount of weight I was carrying. Yeah, very good questions. And water, um, I've been traveling in the North long enough that uh, I trust my own body with just drinking straight water from the lakes. So I didn't have a filter of any sort. I just drank water straight from the streams and straight from the lakes. Huh. Uh, by the way, you answered my question, which was gonna be, where did you get the twigs for the big go? There you go, you know. Yes, great. Um, we talked about injury, and so this is a great question that uh, we just got online uh, from Mr. Fazio's class. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Fazio. They want to know if you had an injury, illness, or bear attack, how long would it take you for you to receive help? Like, how do you get people out there? How long is that going to take? Yeah, so 
in the planning, I was anticipating minimum a day. So if anything ever happened to me and I was able to communicate my problem back to um, my contact in Yellowknife and try to get a plane out, um, I always planned for minimum a day. Yeah, it's very rare that you'd be able to, in that remote of a location, that I would be able to get someone um, to come and help me or to come and get me in less than 24 hours. Pretty much always be the next day. Or even more, it could even be two or three days if there's a weather um, right. challenge, for example. Which is why, and you mentioned this, and a lot of our explorers mentioned this, a preparation is so key, trying to minimize the risk and make sure you're never in a situation where that would happen is one of the most important things for any uh, expedition. So I'm, I'm glad you uh, ran into no difficulties because of your prep. That's yes. Uh, Miss Keith class joining us in Thunder Bay. They had a question, so I want to bring them in. Hi, Miss G. Go for it. Okay. Hi, good morning. Um, we have a couple questions. Well, I don't want to see them on the screen. So we wanted to know, with the lack of trees, how do humans breathe? Did you notice any difference in the air quality compared to where we live on the Canadian? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, air quality. Um, the air is amazing. Um, yeah, it's so far from communities or any <clears throat> any sources of pollution that um, you'd never smell anything. It just smelled so um, pure and so good. Um, and you know, the one one thing that I remember noticing on the hike was that just being out for so long, um, out of communities, the smell kind of becomes a little bit more attuned because you're not getting these really strong, overpowering smells um, frequently, like a smell of exhaust or smell of um, uh, perfumes or something and so I there was actually times where I would smell plants and be like oh that plant has a smell I never realized that before but uh yeah you're it's like the sense just becomes a little more sensitive yeah um that's super cool I uh I got your question in writing too Miss G so just to clarify for some of your students as well in terms of oxygen you don't actually need trees near you to have that sort of oxygen effect you're always mm -hmm. able to breathe mm -hmm. off wherever you are and that's right. exactly the fact that gases circulate around the whole world just because mm -hmm. carbon dioxide produced in one area mm -hmm. the whole planet, mm -hmm. as opposed to just one individual area. So cool question, guys. Yes. All right. Let's go to Mr. Bocci's class joining us in Toronto, and then we're going to come next to Pinecrest. Uh, Mr. Bocci, go for it. Hi. Um, my students were wondering what your favorite wild food was that you found in the Okay. My favorite wild food. Um, yes. I... I think the, um, I would have to say the blueberries. Yeah, the blueberries on the Arctic um, tundra, they're, they're these little low blueberries. They're not the same as the blueberries you'd buy in a store. They're these really tiny. They, they may be, uh, I guess they're really the tallest ones are maybe a foot tall. And a lot of them on the tundra, they grow even shorter. They're only like an inch or two, maybe um, really like a carpet almost. And uh, but the taste is so strong and so great, and they're so dark. Um, but they're also quite acidic, so I found I couldn't eat a huge amount of them. My body just like it's too much acid, um, too strong. But uh, but I love the flavor, Dwayne. I think there's like a niche cookbook in your future if you want to do that as like a supplement to the expedition, like talking about all the mushrooms and the berries and stuff. I'd buy it, I don't know what other people, but we'll see. Um, let's go. Class, if you're class, you guys have one, come on up. All right, the student that's gonna ask question right there, yeah. Go for it. Mm -hmm. the Mr. Stellan, could you uh, repeat that for us, please? Uh, the coolest thing that you saw on your hike. Ooh, no pressure, Dwayne. Coolest thing on the whole hike. The coolest thing. Uh, you know what? I will actually go into um, one of the coolest things about, glac about eskers that isn't well understood is um, that some of the eskers actually have ice cores. So inside the esker, so you have the ridge, the esker, and then inside of that, down low, um, you often have a core of ice. And so there's places in the summer when the esker is warm where and that ice is melting, you actually have a stream that basically is flowing out of the esker. So um, there was a couple of places I saw where you have a big, like a big circle 
of uh, Esker Ridge. And right out of the side of the Esker down low is a stream. It basically is like a spring and it's just flowing right out of the Esker and it's super clear, um, crystal clear water. Yeah, I've never heard of that. How cool is that? Again, mm -hmm. it's so nice to get to depict the Arctic as something other than a frozen barren wasteland. Now, there's parts of the Arctic that are mm -hmm. frozen year round, but a lot of it is beautiful. Like you showed, I love the fall colors too. So mm -hmm. that is a neat question, guys. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to Holton Virtual uh, for mm -hmm. Mr. Class. Uh, come on in, just demute your mic, Miss Lou, and uh, you're good to go. Hi, Dwayne. We are really excited to meet you. My class has been super excited. Hello. Um, Sorry, I don't know if you can hear us. That's okay. So, sorry, my teaching partner is in the room with me. Um, so Fatima actually had a really good question. Fatima, do you want to unmute your mic and just say it really loudly? Hi, Fatima. Hello? Yeah, not coming through yet, Ms. Lou. Oh. Can you hear for us? I can I can the question for her. She says, okay. "How do you know if the berries and mushrooms were safe to eat?" Great question. Ah, uh, yes. Very good question. So yes, um, and I've been doing um, canoe mostly canoe trips, but also a few hikes in the Northwest Territories for a good number of years, and so I've learned which berries and mushrooms are good to eat. And uh, certainly it's important to know those plants before you uh, pick them and eat them because there are some berries and some mushrooms that are poisonous. So yeah, I had uh, I was familiar with uh, those berries before the hike. Yeah, Fatima, you asked the question I was gonna ask next. So thank you for that, um, <laughs> mushrooms especially. Um, awesome guys. So we have time for another round of questions. We're whipping through these. Dwayne, this has been great. I'm gonna yeah, yeah. from uh, YouTube really quick and then we'll come back yeah, yeah. for another round. Okay. Well, Miss Plant, Plants class, you talked a lot about the wildlife and the lack of trees. What vegetation is there? So you've talked about this, the sort of mm -hmm. the, the most, the biggest part of the landscape that you're running into. Super. Yes. Um, so you maybe remember the photo that I showed of an esker um, where it was red on the top. And so um, those plants were Arctic bearberry, which is a type of a type of berry and it's edible, but it's um, not a very, a lot of people don't like it. I do pick it and I did eat it some on the hike. Um, so that's, there's a there's actually probably like at least a half dozen different types of berries. Um, the dominant shrub or plant though that you see on the tundra is uh, dwarf birch. So it's a type of birch, but it only grows on the tundra in a lot of places. It would only be a foot, a foot tall. Um, in some places where there's better kind of microclimate, maybe on the edge of the esker or where there's a stream, sometimes that dwarf birch would grow, it could grow 10 feet tall. Um, there are also willows in some places where there's more moisture and a little more heat on a south facing slope perhaps. Um, but dwarf birch and willow, mostly dwarf birch are the dominant kind of shrubs. And then um, there's a lot of lower plants that are just like a few inches tall. Um, so you'll get, um, um, what's the other ones? Um, crowberry is really common. It's actually a berry, but it looks like an evergreen plant and it grows totally like a carpet. Like it just fans out kind of, and it'll never be more than an inch or two tall. And it almost looks like, a, like an evergreen carpet. It's amazing. And um, which other plants are really dominant? Yeah, that's a few of them, I guess. And uh, there were a lot of mushrooms. It was amazing how many mushrooms grow on the tundra. Like you're up above tree line and the climate is too harsh for trees, but there's plenty of mushrooms. Yeah. Cool. Um, great question, guys. All right, let's dive back in with another round. Miss Erickson's class, come on back mm -hmm. up and go for it. Ali, if you could go ahead and unmute your mic and ask your question. Mm -hmm. the, the oh, Lynn, uh, your mic's muted, so we wouldn't hear it anyway. Were you able to hear it? No. no. Oh, all right. She wanted to know what other foods um, that you eat besides what you mentioned. Yeah, so those were pretty much, um, I ate uh, uh, various types of berries, 
um, and the mushrooms, but then the food that I, are, you're interested in the food that I packed along as well, right? Yeah. Um, so yes, I, um, because of the challenge of gathering twigs and cooking on a twig stove, then I tried to take a lot of food that wasn't, uh, didn't need to be cooked. And so I took um, basically granola for all of my breakfast um, so that I didn't have to cook it. I could just have a little bit of granola with perhaps some berries that I had picked the evening before. And then my lunches and snacks during the day, I just took um, some dried jerky that I had made myself. Um, outside of this hike, I do hunt, so I make a lot of my own jerky. So I had bison and moose jerky um, that I had made myself that I took along, as well as a lot of nuts and a little bit of dried fruit as well. And I'm a huge fan of chocolate, so I take lots of dark, dark chocolate, like good. Yeah. And... Um, um, and so then I only cooked one meal a day. So just in the evening meal, then I would gather twigs and cook a meal. And then it would be uh, um, typically on this hike, I cooked uh, a lot of um, rice and lentils with a few dried veggies. Yeah. And, um, and then I fried lots of mushrooms that I gathered along the way. So not only am I going to reiterate again the need for this niche cookbook, but it's amazing how many explorers uh, have chocolate as their main thing. So all our the classes, whenever you eat chocolate, you can say you're prepping to become an explorer, and I think that's a really good thing to share with your parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's go to Ms. Curtis's class. Uh, just give me your mic. Come on in. Go for it. Hi there. Hi. You talked about the weather a little bit being really windy. How mm -hmm. strong were the winds? What was the other weather? Did you have a thunderstorm? Yes, I was. I was lucky with the weather. I never got hit by any crazy storms. Um, certainly, there were some thunderstorms in the vicinity of where I was, and there was one night when I moved my tent because I thought I was going to really get nailed by a big thunderstorm. But in the end, it passed just beside me, and all I got was a bit of wind and a few drops of rain. But um, so I was really lucky, but uh, certainly some of the just windier days um, were strong enough that uh, hiking, I'd be leaning into the wind, you know, so that I didn't fall over. It was pretty strong, like strong enough that you couldn't let go of anything because if you did, it would be flying, gone. <laughs> so um, you made sure everything is attached well. And uh, at a break, for example, um, I would uh, I would dry my tent hanging onto it, but uh, you couldn't let go of it. So if you let go of it, it would be, you know, 100 meters gone down the tundra. And um, if I wanted to put anything out to dry on the rocks, then I would have to, uh, on the esker, I would have to put rocks on top of them so that they, uh, they didn't fly away. And um, one of my biggest worries the entire hike, the thing that was always on my mind was, um, whenever the boat is inflated, don't let go because the boat is just like this huge sail and it only weighs uh, like a, just over a pound. And so if that got, um, if I let go of it in a strong wind, it could be, it could be miles. I could be spending days chasing that boat <laughs> across the tundra to recover it. So. You're, you're laughing about all this because none of it ever happened. So lucky you again, good job at all the prep. Um, speaking of weather, I miss Romanian class. And again, I think all of Halton is here for you. So welcome into all of Halton Virtual Elementary. Way to go. I miss Romain's class. I want to know what the weather was generally. What about the temperatures? How warm is it or cold is it when you're walking? Yes, yes. Great question. So at the very beginning of my hike, I actually had a heat wave at the beginning that um, I totally didn't didn't expect and wasn't really mentally prepared for. So the first two weeks of my hike basically um, were highs in the kind of 25 degrees Celsius to up to 33 degrees Celsius. Um, I don't know the Fahrenheit temperature scale as well for those of you in the United States, but um, Anyways, it was pretty hot and too hot to hike. So what I did on those days is I would wake up super early in the morning and uh, I would hike um, until it got hot. And then often around 10.30 or 11 a.m., I would actually set up my tent and take a break in my tent for even some days for six hours. I would be waiting out the, the heat of the day. And then in the evening, I would hike for a few more hours often. So yeah, the you have this... Uh, the image of the of the Canadian Arctic is often of uh, ice and snow, and that's definitely the dominant season. It's mostly it's winter for most of the year, but um, those short summers can be very hot. Um, 
But then later in my hike, so that was the first two weeks were really hot, but then it slowly cooled because again, it's a short summer. So that summer season changes quickly. And by the end of my hike, I was having uh, frost every night and uh, there was puddles on the ice or puddles. Puddles had ice on them by the end of my hike. And uh, I would even have my, my water bottle stored inside the tent overnight, would even have ice on it in the morning um, towards the end of my hike. To our one American classroom that's joining us, I want to stress that not all of Canada is like this at all times. I know we have some stereotypes about our weather, but uh, <laughs> very cool to have a, you know an, an expedition where you get to experience so many different habitats and climbs uh, as you're going along. So I'm glad we got that. All right, we're going to go to Miss D. Yeah. If you're through in order, Miss D, if you want to come back in for another question, go for it. Welcome in Thunder Bay. Hi. Just okay, we're we're back on. We had a couple yeah. of questions. We're already answered, so thank you for that. Um, we wanted to know what, if you encountered an animal, because you mentioned you didn't bring a rifle, what would you mm -hmm. do to defend yourself? Yeah. Yes, so I had, um, I took along two cans of bear spray, and I also took along um, two handheld marine flares. So they're a little device, they're about uh, yay long and a round little tube, and you hold them in your hand, and then they flame out the top and they last for about uh, three minutes, I believe. So, um, so bear spray was my first line of defense. But um, if uh, if a bear was really being aggressive or the bear spray didn't work, then uh, the marine flares were a last uh, last um, resort. And uh, basically, with those, I'd have a torch in my hand for three minutes. So. Um, fear of fire is very uh, strong in most animals. So if you all of a sudden have this huge glowing torch in your hand for three minutes, you've got three minutes to really scare them well so that they're running the opposite direction. Three minutes of protection against a grizzly. Uh, <laughs> it never has to happen. So I'm glad you didn't have any serious encounters. And then again, this is something that most, uh, it's worth noting for a lot of our expeditions, there's a lot of people who always worry about animal interaction. Most animals, um, if you give them space, you respect them, you're unlike mm -hmm. them in a situation mm -hmm. where they're dangerous wild animals. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Minecraft, Mr. Selms class, come mm -hmm. on back. Mm -hmm. Good work, guys. How do you keep your food from getting sore? Was that how do you keep your food from getting spoiled? How do you keep your feet from getting sore? Oh, oh yes, okay. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> a lot of the work in keeping your feet from being sore is uh, in advance, making sure you have the right shoes. And, um, but then along the way, treating your feet well, I guess, trying to keep your feet dry as much as possible. Um, so I took sandals along for all of the water and boat crossings. And that way I was able to keep my shoes, my main hiking shoes dry most of the time. There was a few days when I was having a lot of um, uh, rain or wet weather, then my shoes would just be wet all the time. But for the most part, there was probably only uh, you know a half dozen or less days when I was hiking with wet feet. So that's that's probably the biggest really thing I did was to uh, make sure my feet were dry, have good shoes that I knew um, um, would be good for my feet and fit me well. But um, I also had to a couple times. Um, I had uh, blisters on the tops of my toes from rubbing at the front of my shoes when I would be descending uh, the esker, going down the esker. And uh, there was a few times when I actually put tape around my toes to stop those blisters, to cover them up so that they're not rubbed anymore. But uh, I took really light hiking shoes, actually, not a big heavy pair of boots. And those light shoes are more flexible and they're not as bad for blisters. So. Um, yeah, I was lucky to not have to deal with anything really, uh, really painful or really bad. Foot hammering and dark chocolate. Sounds like the expedition for me, Dwayne. Um, <laughs> uh, let's finish up with Ms. Lou's class. This has been great, guys. You guys have had awesome questions. Uh, Ms. Lou, if you want to wrap us up, come on up and do you your right. Go for it. For sure. Uh, Denvita had a question about Eskers, actually. So, Denvita, did you want to unmute your mic? Let's try this. Take three on the intercomputer. Question mm -hmm. relay. Shuffle. Mm -hmm. You can repeat it for us. We're not Did getting you it. Hear it? No. So no. she asked, "How sturdy are eskers, and how long can they um, stay sturdy for, and can they break?" Yeah. 
Yeah, so they're actually very um, strong and resilient and sturdy. Um, they have been basically on the tundra since the last um, ice sheet melted on North America. So that's really difficult to imagine how much time this is, but it's like in the thousands of years. Um, I think the, the last um, sheet of ice disappeared somewhere around, I can't remember the exact, but 8,000 maybe years ago. And so um, those eskers have been there for thousands of years, the way they are. And uh, they do slowly, uh, you know, erosion from rain, rain and snow and wind. Slowly they'll decrease in in height and um, um, and I guess, yeah, they slowly decrease over time, but uh, they'll last a long time. Yes. Uh, Dwayne, this has been such a fun opportunity to hear about, again, a really unique ecosystem, an awesome expedition. Kudos to you for planning and doing all this in like a matter of a year, which is basically unheard of in expedition planning. So I uh, really appreciate your time today. Okay. It was a pleasure to be here. And thanks for all the great questions. It was great to, uh, to hear questions from students and teachers. This was fantastic. Well, Dwayne, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers. So Ms. Gerdes, Ms. Lou, Ms. Erickson, Ms. G, and Mr. Sellen, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye to Dwayne today, you are all in the broadcast. Thank you. Okay. And have a wonderful day.